Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. Anyone else feeling violently ill? Just an isolated incident? That's okay. For those that don't know me, my name is Chris, and I have the privilege to be part of the team here at The Gathering. What a wonderful place and a wonderful time of worship this morning. It was amazing. Um, Where do we start? We'll open up the notes and we'll go from there. Today's message is called Who is Watching or Who's Watching? Ever heard the saying, knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit, wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad? (laughs) It's good. It's true. It's a fact. Well, today, knowledge is knowing that I can speak into a microphone. Wisdom is allowing me to do so. So we'll see how the time goes. Some time ago... I was in a position where I was... Oh, actually, I'm just going to mainly stick to my notes. I figure if I stick to my notes, we have less chance of me going on some weird tangent. So bear with me. Be graceful, please. Some time ago, I was in a position where I was left feeling torn between two worlds. In making the wrong choice, it could leave one feeling devastated and unsure about their future. You know when you've made that commitment to something and then something else better comes along and you feel like... Should I have really made the commitment to the last thing? Well, I was right in that place. To be transparent, it was a battle between good and evil. And I was right at that place where I knew that a moment's moment's breakthrough could really distinguish between uh, what God wanted me to do and what the world wanted me to do. You have moments of weakness. And so to be transparent, I was fasting for two weeks and I thought this is good spiritual practice. I had another week to go, three weeks of fasting, prayer. Two weeks in, I am flying, kicking goals, not a a worry. Until we go to a friend's house where I had neglected to tell them that I had given up sweets for the three weeks. And on the table was a fresh array of pastries. Now, for those who know me, I actually believe that pastries were created on the eighth day after God had rested on the Sabbath. (laughs) Pastries are a weakness for me. And so therefore, there was pastries on the table and I'm like, do I ask for permission or do I ask for forgiveness? (laughs) Do I go down the road of consuming this pastry and just allowing God's grace just to wash over me at the end. Well, I thought I'd put his grace to the test and I went for the pastries. Straight in. I couldn't believe it. They were there. Right on the table. And I just went in. The apricot Danish was particularly tasty. And I didn't actually feel any condemnation or sin or anything until I actually swallowed the first bite. And then I felt it wash over me. I felt sick to my stomach. And I actually came to the thought of, if I was able to give in to pastry, what level of self-control do I have when something else pops up that might be a little bit more testing? We have all sorts of consequences for our actions. And I thought God may strike me down in that moment, but he didn't. And so at that point, I I thought to myself, what was something else I could do in that situation? Dive into the pastry? Or could I have said no? It would have been a really easy response. No thanks, I'm fasting, I'm off sweets. But I could have offended them. I could have taken one and pretended to eat it and just feed the rest of the dog. Or I could have taken one for later and when I got home, snuck it and said, oh, I'm still fasting as everything's fine. But no, I didn't. I just went head, head first straight into, the, uh, straight into the pastry. The reason for that story is, is how do we act when, someone, when nobody is watching? Behind closed doors, away from the world and away from the scrutiny of others, do we operate with the same values in public as we do in private? 
Do we give in and show little self-control when no one else is around? Today, I'd love to talk about that, the word that sums it up in those questions beforehand. And that term or that word is integrity. And help give some practical ways that we can grow in integrity and why integrity is a necessary character quality we need to reflect a life of Christ. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, help. Amen. <laughs> Charles Swindoll puts integrity this way. Integrity is practical holiness. True holiness is practical holiness, and the character quality that sums, up, sums it up is integrity. Integrity is what distinguishes a consecrated follower of Jesus. We are honest with our dealings with others. We are people of reliable honesty. We are undivided in our commitment to living out the truth, so there is no duplicity. We are people of moral excellence and ethical purity. We deal fairly and equitably with all others, and therefore, we are people that others can respect. Only God's grace gives us the strength to live that way. I love how Chuck speaks about integrity as a character quality. A little tip for us all, character is something that we aren't born with. Mic drop. That's a bit of a bombshell. Romans 3, uh, sorry, Romans 5, 3 to 6 in the NLT says, we can rejoice when we run into problems, which are trials and temptations, for we know they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope in salvation. And this hope will, lead, will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly our God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. Character is refined like silver in the purification process, the heating process. It is when we are heated and when the silver is heated, it brings all the impurities to the surface and then the silversmith scoops off the, that top layer of impurities, discards it, and then the process starts again. It's refined, it's refined, it's refined. And that's exactly what happens in our Christian walk. We go through hardships, we go through um, where God has made promises and we go through those moments of hope, but then we don't see the promises work out how we thought they might have worked out. We are refined by trials and sufferings. But one thing I wish someone had told me when I was recommitting my life to Jesus was that don't expect an easy ride. Just because we found Jesus or I found Jesus, does, it means that my future is secure. I have eternity in heaven. But it's just the start of the restoring process and that we have a way to go. Integrity is a character quality. We, again, are not just born with integrity, honesty, and wisdom, and good judgment. They are things that we have to grow into through correction, trials, suffering, and temptations. Isn't this an uplifting message, folks? <laughs> I have a couple of favorite characters in the Bible. Most of us do. Uh, we're usually drawn to people who are like us. Um, uh, isn't it funny how God knew exactly what he was doing when he was writing the Bible and using characters in the Bible to, for us to identify with and, and sort of see that person and go, oh, that person does exactly the same things I do. Uh, for me, I'm a real fan of Gideon. He was a bit shy. Uh, he wasn't really noticed at times. He felt a bit inadequate and he lacks faith at times, but God still used him mightily. People like Esther, I don't relate to her in a female capacity, but I do relate to her in the way in which she was able to stand strong and actually uh, which she was placed in a position of authority and was then able to use her influence to stop the annihilation of her people for a time such as this. However, I really relate to Joseph. The Bible describes him as well-built and good-looking. <laughs> so there's enough of that. As many of us know, the story of Joseph is found in Genesis 37 to 50. From the start of where we see Joseph, he was quite a brash young man, full of himself, probably not the most humble of humans. And I know that if I was his brother, I would be a little bit irritated by him as well. Being the favoured son by Jacob, uh, he got himself a Technicolor coat. Um, I don't know how that would go in this day and age, but it seemed to be cool back in the day. Um, <laughs> Some th a lot of scholars called Joseph proud or carried a, a spirit of pride. I don't necessarily agree with all of those well-educated scholars. Um, 
But I do see that uh, he may have been a little bit keen to speak and didn't quite read the room when the opportunity presented itself. Um, however, I do believe that his brother probably despised him because of what the hand of God had upon, or God's hand upon him at the time. And uh, it may have been the source of their jealousy and pride. But um, as we find, as we, before we launch into Joseph's life, the story of Joseph actually proves that he was a real man of integrity. Um, a quick overview of Joseph's life before we get into the chapter that we're going to be a part of today was he was about 17 uh, when he first started having these dreams and, and visions about being in authority over his family or his brothers or them all bowing down to him. He was given his fancy coat by his father um, and he was also put in uh, in control of all of making sure that all of his brothers were doing the right thing. So Jacob would send him out and he would say, because he trusted Joseph, he would go out and say, make sure that your brothers are doing the right thing. And then Joseph would come back and make a report. Now, again, if you're going to upset anyone going out and telling that your brothers aren't doing the right thing when they should be doing the right, the, you know, they're doing the wrong thing and they should be doing the right thing. Um, again, doesn't lend one to much favoritism with your brothers and siblings. Then, because of that hate and because of that, that um, them, being, them despising him, he was then sold into slavery. Uh, and at the age of 17, he was, we then find him in slavery, but he was then bought by a gentleman by the name of Potiphar. He, he was an Egyptian general, and we're going to pick it up from chapter 39, verse 6, if you would like to follow along. So Genesis 39, verses 1 to 6. And it says, When Joseph was taken by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar. So he made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. I thought I'd just throw that in and out at the bottom there. Um, <laughs> There are several key points that I'd like to dive into from this chapter and to, to speak to the integrity of Joseph and that led him to positions that God had planned for him and how we can apply them into our daily lives. He was a man of integrity because he showed total commitment to his employer's success. Hands raised if you work for someone. So if you were an employee and you work for someone, four people, okay. Um, <laughs> we might have to work out some of the crowd participation and so forth. That's fine. Um, <laughs> work that out for next time. Can you word them up next time as they walk in? Yeah. It's my first time, man. Come on. <laughs> I, won't answer, I won't ask this. Now, for all of Joseph's perceived naivety in chapters uh, earlier, we see a shift in his attitude. We saw a young man full of enthusiasm and also playing a little bit off his father's favoritism. But how humbling one situation becomes when we're put through what, your brothers put him, what his brothers put him through. When you are sold into slavery and you end up in a cage and then you end up in a foreign land in a house where you don't know what's going to happen next. As you were sold to slave merchant, merchants hundreds of miles away into a foreign land, Joseph had been taught about respect and honour of people in authority. This doesn't occur while one is stuck in a cage. It occurs over time. It is something that would have been taught to him, the fact that he had to show, uh, show respect to his um, people in authority. It says that so Joseph, had, so Joseph would have had to understand what it meant to have hard work and to work hard for those in authority. As parents, we have a responsibility to teach our children what it is to work hard. Take the time to develop honesty and integrity in our children. 
Proverbs 22.6 says, Direct your children in the right path, and when they are older, they will not depart from it. Joseph understood hard work and the attitude it took to excel. So it says in the scripture in chapter 39 that the Lord was with Joseph and he succeeded in everything that he did. And as he served in the home of his master, Potiphar noticed that the Lord was with Joseph and giving him success in everything that he did. We see from this little passage that Joseph was completely committed to his owner in a foreign land. Does our attitude towards our work ethic reflect Christ? How easily it could have been for Joseph just to blend in and be inconspicuous and not to cause any trouble to get through life and just lay low. I know at 17, if I was put in his position, um, I would have thought, well, my dreams are over. My time is done. God's given me these things. I've been sold into slavery. I don't know how I would have reacted if I was put in Joseph's situation. One could come in that it was a punishment for God for his perceived pride. But no, to Joseph's credit, thank you, he showed a level of integrity and said, I'm not sure why I'm here, but I'm here, and I'm going to commit to serving this man with 100% of what I have for either a period of my life or for, for the rest of my life. I believe Joseph had this attitude because he knew God's plan. He knew that God was still with him. He had him in hand, and he didn't look at it by a judging of the circumstances. He knew that God's plans was above even his own capacity and uh, where he was in life. So maybe that's something for somebody else here today. In the middle of the circumstances and in, middle of the, in the middle of the storm or the trial that you're going through right now, God is right here with you. As Peter did when he stepped out of the boat, he fixed his eyes on Jesus and he walked on water. A lot of people tend to focus on the fact that Peter sank when he looked at the, world around, or the circumstance around him. I always like to think that he got out of the boat. And that's not a bad place to start. He got out of the boat more than what any of us had ever done. More than the other 12 in there. But he got out of the boat. And he did walk on water. But then he looked at the circumstances around him and that consumed him. Maybe God's placed on your heart a dream and a vision many years ago, but you've given up hope because of the circumstances you're in. I encourage you today, don't give up hope. God has placed hope and he's placed dreams in your heart. He's placed visions in your heart. And just because of circumstance, don't give up hope. Hope is not the poor cousin of faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. Don't give up hope. Don't give up on the plan or the dream that God has sown into your life. So from Potiphar's point of view, he's got himself a pretty good deal. Here is a young man. He's come across... He's strong, he's bright, he looks the part, he's switched on. And he's prepared to serve in a way that none of his other servants would serve. Joseph brought the very best of his attitude and his work ethic to that place in a foreign land. And because of that, God was upon him. And God, uh, God blessed everything that he did. Integrity is seen as in our attitude to work. Proverbs 27, 18 says, As the workers who tend the fig tree are allowed to eat, so the workers who protect their employer's interests will be rewarded. I actually had that as a sign when I had people working for me. Just, just as a bit of a thing as they walked in the door. Um, do we work for someone? Do we sometimes do menial tasks? Do we uplift our employer or our pastor? Do we put them down? Well, this verse promises that you will be rewarded if you elevate that person. In today's world, we're taught to despise those who run businesses and are successful and are wealthy, as they've obviously ripped somebody off. And that attitude starts to creep into the hearts of employees or maybe the hearts of volunteers or whatever the case is. But I encourage you again, don't allow the world's viewpoints of what their, their views and their moral code to influence and infiltrate what is in the Word of God. The Bible is clear. Hold them highly. Hold their interests highly, and that will be rewarded. 
and that is integrity. Proverbs 2, 7 says, He grants the, grants the treasure of common sense to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. Proverbs 10, 9 says, People with integrity walk safely, but those who followed crooked paths will be exposed. Being a person of integrity requires us to show commitment, not to gossip, not to speak poorly, or even an inward attitude, not to have the inward attitude of, I could do a better job than this. People of integrity show respect, commitment, honesty, and humility, all in the name of upholding values that are Christ-like. As I touched on, Joseph was only 17. 17. How many 17-year-olds do we know that would carry work ethic like that? I know that when I was 17, I had been working since I was the age of 12, and I had a fairly good work ethic, but nothing like that. I think at the age of 12, that would have been considered slave labor, but I was getting paid at the time. It wasn't a problem, but I know that, that the, the, I didn't have the best attitude towards my employers all the time. I didn't go ahead and do the task thinking that this is what God had planned for me. Surely digging holes in the mud is not something that God has planned for me, but it was, because what it teaches you is that sometimes you just got to grind life out. Sometimes, not everything, as Christians and believers in Jesus, life just sort of sails on by. Sometimes you've got to grind it out. Joseph held on to the promise that God's eye, God was with him and that he had to keep his heart in check. Integrity comes in all different shapes and sizes. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called the screw tape letters. It's one of the most interesting. Anyone ever read the screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis? Yeah, fascinating book. If I encourage you to read it, um, that's okay to mention C.S. Lewis in this. Yeah. Um, for those who haven't read it, here's a quick summary. Screw tape is a head demon, and he is teaching his young nephew about the tactics used to win people for the dark world. It's written from the perspective of Screwtape being the head demon, writing instructional letters to his nephew, who is a novice demon, about the t best tactics there are to employ that to, you should employ to trick people up. The tactics are sly, subtle, but highly effective, uh, both towards those who are unbelievers and mostly towards those that they trip up who are on the side of God, for they are from the point of view that we are the enemy. The enemy wants nothing more to see more than to see you fail. It says in scripture he goes about as a roaring lion seeking who he can devour. Temptations come in all shapes and sizes. Temptations are going to be the things that challenge our integrity. From Potiphar's point of view, Joseph could do no wrong. Because of him, his wealth and even his status in Egypt had gone from strength to strength. To strength. From a professional point of view, he could not be happier. He put Joseph in the highest of positions in his household and was looking to further him. Joseph could have had every reason or opportunity to let success go to his head. How easily it could have been for the enemy to drop that little bit of flattery in his path. Well, he did. The enemy found a way to try and trick up Joseph. You see, not only was Potiphar impressed with Joseph's success, but so was Mrs. Potiphar. She liked the look of the young Jewish bit of eye candy. It, was, it says he was good looking and well built. And have you ever judged a book by its cover? Little did she know. My guess is that Potiphar's wife wasn't ugly. I guess she was, would have been fairly attractive. Uh, she was the wife of a person in high authority. She would have been living the life of luxury. Um, she would have been having oils, creams, Nile River mud baths, um, some Gothic style makeup, just to keep the, you know, that harsh Arabian sun at bay. Um, and she would have been well looked after. But it says in the King, New King James that she looked at Joseph with longing eyes. It's like longing eyes. What does that look like? It's like when they had that cut from Bold and the Beautiful and they stand there and, and how long those longing eyes last. In other translations, it says that she looked upon him with lust. Not love, lust. Now, put yourself in Joseph's shoes. He runs the household. He has full autonomy. Potiphar has put him in levels of high esteem. 
he has complete faith. And Potiphar puts his complete faith and trust in Joseph. And this has probably happened over the past maybe six, seven, eight years that he's been in that household. He wanted for nothing, it says in verse 6. Now Potiphar's wife makes a pass at him. He's not married. He doesn't have any commitments. He's young. He's in the prime of his life. He's in a large house with many rooms. How easily it could have started to have an illicit affair. Because that's all it would have been. It would have been just an affair. We're all grown-ups in the room. This is a man built in the prime of his life. He was handsome and well-built and in a position of authority. The very recipe that the enemy wanted to use to try and start him on a road to impurity. I don't think this is something that we should take lightly. I don't want to just skim over this part. Temptation is a very real thing. Jesus alone was tempted by Satan himself. I wanted to highlight this for a reason. The enemy knows you very well. He knows human nature very well. He knows our flaws. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our insecurities, our physical needs. And as you've heard in my initial story, pastry. He's the master of deception and knows where our weaknesses lie. He can pick that little weakness in the armour and he can sow seeds in the mind and put situations in place that ultimately could trip you up. Proverbs talks about the temptation on a regular basis. For all the young and older men out there, particularly the first seven chapters of Proverbs is, a, is vital to dealing with temptation. In Proverbs 4, 23 to 27, it says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk and stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. That then flows into chapter 5, where it talks about to avoid the immoral woman. And then again repeats that in chapter 6. And then it goes back to st in chapter 7 about um, hanging, out, hanging out with promiscuous women. These are the real temptations that come before us each and every day. These are just examples used in chapter seven, 5, 6 and 7. But they are real. They are very real. So it is important... That these, things, that, that these things are talked about, that they're not just skimmed over. The enemy will use subtlety, flattery, brazenness, and pretty, pretty speech. It says in Proverbs chapter 7 again in verse 21 to 27, so she seduced him with her pretty speech and enticed him with her flattery. He followed her at once like an ox going to the slaughter. He was like a stag caught in a trap, awaiting the arrow that would pierce his heart. He was like a flying bird into a snare, little knowing it would cost him his life. So listen to me, my sons, and pay attention to my words. Don't let your heart stray towards her. Don't wander down her path. For she has been the ruin of many, and many men have been her victims. Her house is on the road to the grave. Her bedroom is the den of death. This was written by Solomon, who maybe should have taken a bit of his own advice, <laughs> having 300 wives and 700 con concubines. What a man. Uh, but the principle is still the same. The tactics are the same. Remember Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else because it determines the course of your life. I'd like to clarify that temptation itself is not the sin. Just like pastry wasn't the sin. But it is giving into the temptation that is the sin. God is faithful and he will not let the temptation be more than you can stand. If I can go back to my story at the start, God knew that I could have said no to the pastry. God knew it was actually nothing of consequence. But it was the self-control that I lacked that stopped me and made the temptation actually real. When we are tempted, God will show us a way out and so that we can endure. But did Joseph yield to this temptation? No, he didn't. We don't know how long this went on for. It could have been multiple attempts. Uh, it could have gone on for you know, potentially years. We don't know. And the e easiest thing at the end of the day would have been for Joseph to have yielded. Then what? 
Proverbs 5, 6 and 7 tells us about the consequences of such a decision. Joseph's integrity was such that he says, look, and it says this in verse, I think it's in verse 8 and 9. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. You, um, how could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. So he couldn't do it. Not only was it not right in the eyes of Potiphar, but it was not right in the eyes of God. And that's, at the end of the day, who he was there to serve. Temptation challenges our integrity. Temptations present itself in four main ways. Firstly, there's the bait, and that's what's dropped in front of us. Then there is the hook, and that is the appeal, the attractiveness of the sin. This then creates a third thing, which is the struggle. The struggle between right and wrong, between pleasure and not yet experienced consequences. And fourthly, this leads to response. Did we succumb or did we not? In Joseph's case, the temptation was real. And for a young man in that situation, it had to be one of difficulty. But it was Joseph's response. He fled, as it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, says to run from sexual sin. So he fled. Integrity can be paired with honesty. However, the opposite of integrity is compromise. What does compromise look like? In Joseph's world, it could have been a once-off thing, or it could have been just our little secret. But not all compromise is of that sort of nature. It could be a little fudging of the paperwork to avoid a bill or an expense, a lowering of, one, of one's values or standards to get back a little bit of so-called freedom? Do we compromise on our, raising our children to allow a secular society to have vital input into their lives? Do we sort of not speak up when the opportunity to speak up presents itself because we're afraid of being mistreated? Do we shy away from hard questions or controversial topics because we don't want to be labelled? Compromise comes in all forms and the opposite of honesty, and it is the opposite of honesty and integrity. Integrity requires courage, integrity requires wisdom and discernment, and integrity requires the Holy Spirit. Humanly speaking, you'd say that God could have sorted everything out for Joseph. He did the right thing. Mrs. Potiphar made a pass. He does the right thing, says no, flees from the situation. Great, perfect. All done. Surely God will bless his integrity. Surely he will bless his honesty. Well, it wasn't quite how it panned out for Joseph. Isn't it funny that we think that just because we make a righteous decision that everything will be sorted after that? Usually that's just the beginning. Joseph is accused of attempted rape and then... Um, and Mrs. Potiphar says to her husband that Joseph had made a pass. She rejected and fought him off and has his cloak to prove it. A little interesting side note is that it was a colourful cloak that sold him into, into slavery. And it was the cloak that was retained as evidence and got him thrown into jail. Anyway, I find it very interesting how Potiphar reacted as well. He didn't actually allow Joseph to respond it was an instantaneous, that's it, you're done, out. And I find it really interesting that Joseph, well, it's not recorded, but Joseph didn't put up a fight. I don't know why, but I would say that his integrity held him to keeping his mouth closed. Accusations and allusions to misdeeds are not uncommon. In this day and age of clickbait, journalism, cancel culture, twit face, trial by media. People from all forms of life are in the firing line. However, we as Christians who don't bow to the woke culture but only bow to the king of kings will be in the firing line. I didn't say we may be in the firing line, but we will be. Now more than ever, integrity, character, courage and honesty are integral to the Christian walk. Second Peter 1.5 um, 1, to 8 
It says, do your best to improve your faith by adding goodness and understanding, self-control, patience, and devotion to God, concern for others, and love. If you keep growing in this way, it will show what you know about our Lord Jesus Christ has made your lives useful and meaningful. Can I get the worship team to come back up? That'd be great. Joseph could have thrown his arms up in the air and say, that's it, I'm done. No more. I've not complained. I've never said, why me? I've never said, what have I done to deserve this? Now it's cost me a prison sentence. And it's speculated that from the time that Joseph was sold into slavery to the time that he actually was then made, it came out of prison and made uh, almost like the prime minister of Egypt was a 20 year period, 20 years. For some of us, it's been less. For some of us, it's been more. But again, his integrity is something that, our integrity is something that we are not born with. It is what God uses to shape us, to mold us. Joseph in his suffering knew that God had never left him and God continued to strengthen him, give him favor in the years to come. The success that came to Joseph and his family was a fulfillment of the dreams and the visions that God had placed in his heart. Think about the person that Joseph would have turned into if God had given him everything at the age of 17. God shapes and molds us. Ephesians 2, 10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works that, that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That word workmanship is in the Greek is poinoma, poema, I think it is, meaning that which is manufactured, a product or design produced by an artisan. God is the master craftsman, each one of us uniquely crafted and shaped in his image. This is a process a time-consuming process. From the time we are born again to our last days, in that time as believers, life doesn't become any easier because God wants us not just to flow through life. He wants us to be a representation of life that's devoted to Him. Why? Because He loves us beyond measure. He wants relationship with you and I and for us to love others as we love ourselves. The character quality of integrity is acquired Life will throw temptations and shortcuts all along the way, but true integrity, integrity is what we, what we do right when no one is looking and when no one even cares. It means being uncompromising. And to do that, you will need courage, you will need wisdom, and you will need discernment. The book of Proverbs, I encourage you to read daily. It carries all of those things. For some of us, we may be saying it's too late. I'm already down the road. I can't turn back. But yes, you can. Not in your own strength, but in Christ's. 1 Peter 4, 1 to 5 talks about leaving your past behind. So begin to live now with, intent with being intentional and with integrity, with no compromise to your Christian identity and values. Why integrity? It's a godly principle. As we look again at what Charles Swindoll says, integrity is practical holiness. True holiness is practical holiness, and integrity is what distinguishes us, a consecrated follower of Jesus. It makes us better people, more thoughtful neighbors, attractive, present parents, obedient children, trustworthy business people, and effective disciples for Christ. Proverbs is full of all the benefits of integrity and honesty and destruction. But there is the destruction of compromise and the lack of self-control. Take some time to explore the Proverbs. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs and there's usually 30 to 31 days in a month, a chapter a day, and it'll enrich your life. I read a chapter a day every day and I have for the past, I don't know how many years. I read the same things over and over and over again but there is something that comes to light every time, something fresh, something new. Every time that I read the book of Proverbs, because every different stage that you go through in life, the word of God is going to pop out something and we reveal to you and you will use it. Meditate on the word. Meditate on it. 
Memorize it. Because it is in those times that God will use them. There are nuggets of wisdom that come from there. As I conclude, not only did Joseph show us a great example of integrity, but others like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, Job, Stephen, Paul, and ultimately the perfect life of Jesus. Jesus, though fully man and fully God, never compromised, and he could have in so many ways. Put integrity at the forefront of our character. Take time to study and explore the characters found in scripture and examine the life of Jesus and harness the way in which they live their lives with dedication and holiness to God. As I finish, I would like just to take the opportunity to pray quickly. Just to pray that, that our lives aren't going to be one of just going through the motions. That our lives aren't one of just, oh, well, I'm a Christian and I'm going to heaven. But our lives are ones of integrity and being an example to those in the world that need us, that need Jesus. So Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you that we live in a world, Lord Jesus, that will want us to compromise and take shortcuts and go against what we value and what we know is a value that you, you hold in high esteem in the heavenlies, the godly principles that we own. We know that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we want to live a life that exalts the name of Christ in everything that we do. I pray today, Lord Jesus, that we can walk away knowing a little bit more about what it means to live a life full of integrity, but a life that will please and honour Jesus, your name, you in the heavenlies. So we thank you for this in your precious and holy name, Jesus. Amen.